decision trees and this is something of a classical material I mean more or less the area was closed one can say by one paper of Nissan uh, in 1992 and uh, but uh, so some of what I'm going to say will be in the same spirit so it is an old-fashioned Okay, so this is a very recent work, maybe in the last month or so, and it is uh, jointly with uh, Arthur uh, Chattopadhyay at uh, the IFR and Yogesh Dahiya, uh, IMSC Chennai. Nikhil Mande, who was at the IFR but now is in Amsterdam, and uh, 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 Shagato uh, at uh, again he was at the IFR but now he is at IIT so uh, let me start slowly and we really don't have that much to say so we will do everything as if it's an undergraduate class so we have boolean functions and uh, here are some typical examples of boolean functions not really necessary for this audience to explain all of them uh, but just let me uh, majority uh, function it is one if the majority of the input bits are one and the parity is one if uh, an odd number of input bits are one and then there is this address function uh, it provides some sort of pathological examples for many questions so I would like to explain what it is so this function it has let us say k plus 2 to the k bits. Okay, so these k bits are to be thought of as address, and uh, this is actually the data. So there is, you can imagine that there is an array with 2 to the k bits in it, and this is the address into the array. So when given this entire input, what you are expected to do is to treat these k bits as index into the array and then read off the bit in the array. So that is what I meant to say here. That is, look at the bit v, yeah, the at position a1, a2, a3. And if that is one, the value of the function is one. If it is zero, the value of the function is zero. So this is Boolean function. We knew this long ago. And you have decision trees. Now, what are decision trees? So they're just what you know. Uh, you query a variable, and based on the value of the variable, you go left or right. Yes. Yeah, so you go, if it is zero, you go left. If it is one, you go right, and you do this. Yeah. And in the end, when you reach a leaf, yeah. I don't know if you can see. Yeah. If you reach a leaf, you have to declare an answer. 
And so if you can see, this is the decision tree for the IL function. You keep reading bits one after the other, and the moment a bit turns out to be zero, you can declare the answer to be zero. And uh, yeah, this is the decision tree for parity, and this one is the decision tree for the address function. See, if you get all zeros, then you look at the first bit, the first bit of, well, I wrote Y this time, but uh, please read Y as V, yeah? So you read the bit Y1, and based on that, you declare the answer, but if it is a different address, then you read a different bit, and if it is the all ones, if the address says all ones, then you read the last of these bits. That's how decision trees work. Oh. So now, if you're given a particular function, you can ask, what is the minimum size of a decision tree for that function? You can, so you can take the function offline, construct the best decision tree, and that we call the deterministic depth of the decision tree. And so because I'm emphasizing the word deterministic, you can guess that I'm going to be talking about randomized as well. So what is a randomized decision tree? Uh, we will model a randomized decision tree as a probability distribution over uh, deterministic decision trees. So one could imagine that a randomized decision tree is one in which, as it goes along, it tosses a coin and then branches based on a coin. And that is a fair model for randomized decision tree. In reasoning about it, it somehow is easier to think of a randomized decision tree as one, as a probability distribution over deterministic decision trees. So given a particular input, you're going to pick one of the decision trees based on its probability and run the computation on that decision tree and declare the answer. So for the same input, depending on which decision tree you pick, you could get different answers and you would like that most of the time your answer is correct. That is, if you're computing a certain function, most of the time the value returned by the decision tree that you pick should agree with the value of the function. Okay, so that is what I've tried to write here. So the depth of a randomized decision tree is among all the decision trees to which you have assigned non-zero probability, find out the one which has the biggest depth and that should be bounded. Yeah, that is the depth of the randomized decision tree. So a randomized decision tree of depth D is a probability distribution over deterministic decision trees of depth. Okay. And the error is again, we do the worst case, look at the input on which you perform the worst and ask what is the probability that the output of the decision tree differed from the intended value in the function. Okay. And again, just like the main here, so we try to find out the for a given function and error epsilon, what is the decision, yeah, what is the minimum depth of a randomized decision tree which can compute the function with error at most epsilon. Okay. And today, most of the time, let's say epsilon will be like one fourth. All right, this probably everybody knew. No, yeah, so we are doing worst case depth. If you want expected depth, yeah, so maybe we can truncate it and get to this model. But I allow two sided errors. Depth is a deterministic, yeah, so uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, the bound on the depth is. So yes, so now maybe everybody is familiar with this so the sensitivity of a function. Okay. So what's the sensitivity of a function? I don't know if things are clear. Okay. 
So you're given a Boolean function f. The sensitivity of the function at x is you imagine that you've got this input x and you change one of the bits of x and ask question. Yes, Sorry? The depth is defined as max over probability. Yes, max over probability. No, max over L. And this is just a funny way of saying, I, I intended to say, what is the biggest L for which you have got non zero probability? Uh, so, max over L such that probability is greater than or equal to zero is what I should have written maybe. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, please ignore what I, I tried to write something in a fancy way and it didn't work out, I think. Yeah, so yeah, so. Yeah, something is messed up here, so yeah, don't ignore that. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it should have been the maximum L for which. There is a decision tree in your collection with non zero probability which has depth at least n or something. But yeah, the depth of a randomized decision tree is yeah, you get decision trees of various depth, but everything should be bounded by D. Yeah, and try to get it down. I should write it better. You can also look at the size of the tree, even though it's always going to be. That's the top. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it turns. Uh, so uh, yeah, I will uh, yeah, ask you to say it again. Yeah. <laughs> so sensitivity. Yeah. The sensitivity of a function at an input x is the number of positions at which. Uh, the function at x differs from the function at the neighboring point. So if you imagine things on a hypercube, so yeah, you have a hypercube, and every Boolean function is a labeling of the hypercube with zeros and ones. Every point is labeled zeros and ones. So you've been given a particular point x, and the value of the function is something at that point. Look at the n neighbors and ask how many of those neighbors have different function value than your the function value at x and that number is the sense. Okay. So many of you work in optimization, you should think of it as some sort of how many partial derivatives are non-zero okay. in absolute. Okay. So and again the sensitivity of the function itself is look at the point in the hypercube at which the sensitivity is maximum. And this block sensitivity, maybe this is somewhat even less familiar, but this was Nissan's great innovation. Okay, so and it somehow completely like broke all the resistance that decision trees were offering to theoretical computer science. Okay. Yeah. So what is block sensitivity? So you should, since I talked about this derivative, you should think about it as some directional derivative. So you bought been given a point x, and instead of just looking at your neighbors, you just jump to an arbitrary point by flipping some of the bits. So you have got some x, yeah. You got perhaps an input x, and you flip some of these bits, and you get a different input. Okay. And then ask at that input, does the value of the so if it does. Then this particular block, yeah, will be called a sensitive block at x. One of the sensitive blocks. Now there could be many sensitive blocks at the input x, and uh, you get a collection of disjoint blocks, which are all sensitive. Okay, and the maximum collection of disjoint blocks that you can get, and each block should be sensitive. That is called the block sensitivity of the function at input x. Not necessarily, okay, sorry, yeah, I draw these things like this, but blocks need not be continuous. The block is just a, yeah, sorry, yeah. A block is just a subset 
of input and uh, you want to get disjoint blocks. So for example, if the sensitivity of a function was high, then sensitivity corresponds to blocks being of size one. Yeah. And there things are all, I mean, any two blocks of size one, the distinct blocks are disjoint. Yeah. But this is a generalization, so you can think of as how many sort of truly distinct directional derivatives are non-zero. And truly distinct means they shouldn't share a coordinate. Yeah. If you move in this direction, and you move in this direction, no coordinate should be flipped in both the directions. So anyway. Just to be precise, like DIs have to be uh, blocks for at X. It's not that you. That's right. So this is sensitive for F at X. So B1 to BL such that each BI is sensitive for F at X. I didn't write it here. But. Um, so I don't know. So first of all, uh, if we want to think about computability, we want to ask how is the input even being presented? OK, so we probably have been given the truth table, but let us just say that we have been given uh, access to the true Oracle access to the truth table, and then we want to compute block sensitivity. Uh, first of all, this maximum over X might mess us up. So let us even say that we have talking about a particular X, we've been given an X, and then we are asked what is the block sensitivity. If it was sensitivity, it would have been easy. We would make N queries to the N neighbors and ask what is going on. But block sensitivity, I really don't know. Yeah, it might, the decision tree to compute block sensitivity when the input is presented in this fashion might already have used it. So, yeah, so, this is what I was referring to. So we this we know that the sensitivity uh, yeah, is at most the block sensitivity by definition, and it turns out that uh, blocks uh, block sensitivity is a lower bound. So the randomized decision tree, uh, yeah, the uh, function is hard to compute by a randomized decision tree. And the reason is that somewhere the block sensitivity is large. The function is varying crazily. Yeah. And the deterministic depth is definitely an upper bound on randomized depth. And Nissan showed that block sensitivity is also an upper bound on deterministic depth. So basically, this sort of closes the loop. Block sensitivity decision tree complexity. If one of them is large, the other is large. We can quibble about the exponents here, but uh, in general, this is considered a satisfactory situation. Uh, at the moment, I don't know if like uh, this is tight, I think. Uh, yeah, but uh, overall, this is what is okay. now. Uh, there is an analogous uh, thing that uh, goes on uh, when we think of the model of computation to be polynomials yeah? and we are looking at degrees of polynomials and so a similar inequality holds the question was this was open for a very 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 long time and it was resolved in 2019 yeah? uh, using a uh, beautiful uh, linear algebraic proof so yeah, you should look it up. Degree as the That's right. So take f, interpolate it. Yeah, and uh, maybe as we probably said last time, we can assume it is multilinear. So there is a unique polynomial, yeah, which uh, represents this function and the degree of that. So decision tree size. Okay. So we saw the function for and it had, I mean, it had with depth. You had to query all the n variables before you could, with certainty, say what the value of the function is. But most of the time, you knew the answer immediately. Yeah. And also the depth was n, 
the size, if we count, count the number of leaves as size, was maybe something like n plus one. So uh, one naturally feels that probably size goes as exponential in depth, but there are examples like or etc where the size doesn't go exponentially in depth. The relationship between them is not that clear. Some of you uh, studied communication complexity. There, the depth of the communication and the number of transcripts, they have a good relationship because their trees can be balanced. Okay, In decision trees, trees cannot always be balanced. For example, one doesn't see how uh, there is no other way of computing the AND function other than by this Q. Okay. So, so we define uh, the deterministic size of a function f, that is you uh, find the best tree with the smallest number of leaves. Okay. And that we call the size of the Boolean function f. And uh, the randomized size, yeah. Uh, so this time I hope I try to write it in English and it's correct. Yeah, right. So a randomized uh, decision tree is again a probability distribution over dis uh, deterministic decision trees. And given such a randomized decision tree, we ask um, what is the biggest tree in the support? Yeah, biggest tree that you ever use in this probability distribution. And that is called the size of the randomized decision. And the question we ask in this work is that, OK, the randomized decision tree size is at most the deterministic decision tree size. But uh, can we put an upper bound? Sorry, I should have said this. Uh, yeah, so this basically says that randomized depth and deterministic depth here are all polynomially related because all of them are within the polynomial of block sensitivity, for example. Okay. Now, the question is, what can we say in the case of size? And yeah, that's the question. And here is what we show. So if you have a Boolean function f, then if you look at the log of the deterministic decision tree, it is bounded by the log of the randomized best randomized decision tree for it. And there are some polylog factors up to polylog factors. So certainly randomized decision tree size is less than. The deterministic decision tree size, but. We can also put an upper bound here. Um, so everything is happening in the exponents because it is size. So you take a log and after that they are polynomially related. So just to get a feeling for what this result even says, suppose you had this basically says that if a function has small randomized decision tree size, then it also has a small deterministic decision. So randomization does not help too much in um, decision tree size. For decision tree depth, that's what was the previous result of Nissan. So whatever Nissan showed for uh, depth, a similar thing we are trying to show for size. So if the randomized size is like two to the k, then what this shows is that the deterministic size is something like this. Okay, there might be some constants. Yeah, and uh, if it is two to the polylog n, yeah, then the the exponent in the polylog and here changes a little bit, but otherwise. So in the rest of the time, I want to give you a proof of this theorem, and that's all we will do. Okay. So um, I will restate what we said, but the important sensitivity, once again, for a function at a particular input, block sensitivity is how many different directions can you yeah, move it and change the value of the function? Okay. So what does central role in today's discussion will be played 
by a counting version of block set speed. And uh, so what is that? That's called, they're calling it block number. Okay. And it's just, so as before, a set B is considered sensitive for F at X if moving in the direction B causes the value of the function to change. Now, we say that a set B is minimal sensitive yeah? uh, if the set B is sensitive at X, but no proper subset of it is sensitive. So you look at among all sets that are sensitive for F at X, look at the minimal sets. So that is called a minimal sensitive block for F at X. And the block number at X is the number of minimal sensitive blocks at X. And the block number of the function is you maximize over X. Look at all X's and which X has the largest number of uh, minimal sensitive blocks, and that is called the block number. Is that clear? Okay. So if your function, for example, was like monotone, yeah, and uh, you looked at the all zeros input, yeah, let's assume it's monotone and it's non-trivial, let's say, so the function value at zero is zero, okay, and then there will be all these min terms, yeah, conjunction of some positive literals because it's a monotone function, which will cause the value of the function to change. So that, that's those minimal elements that they form an anti-chain in among the sets. Yeah. So that will be the block number at least. Like the previous slide, you said. That's right. So here we are counting and they are allowed to intersect. Yeah. Uh, they are allowed to intersect and have elements in common, but you count how many of them are there. And that is block number. Uh, what do you say? Yeah, the block number at X. Since I think I started takes the hypercube. Yes. Do like a branch for search. Yes. And for every point time the function value changes, I count that. Is that Sorry? Not no, no, it's, it's a Boolean function. No, it's not like, like it's a... no. No, no, so I, I think you're all right. Yeah. So first of all, I mean, one input is as good as another. Yeah. So let us assume that your starting input was zero. Yeah. And then you just go from the bottom. You imagine the cube as with X at the bottom. Okay. And you look at the first time. So as you start walking, Breath first search means first you look at all inputs which differ from X in one position, yes. differ from X in another position, and so on. Yeah. So there will be a first layer where you encounter somebody who's different. But then everybody above is now eliminated. They can't be called counted in this. Yeah. But there might be somebody else, not necessarily at the same level, yeah. but somewhere else, which as it was the case. So locally we are viewing the function as a monotone function and using our old intuition. So we are counting that number. Is that okay? So this is block number. Yeah. And it turns out that basically that settles it. So what do we know? That the block number, just like block sensitivity provided a lower bound for randomized depth, here block number or log of the block number provides a lower bound for randomized uh, size and the deterministic size is bounded by the randomized size times the log of the block number. Okay. So if the randomized size is small, then definitely the block number is small. That means the product of randomized size and the block number, yeah, log of the block number is small, which means the deterministic size is also small. So up to yeah, ignoring some 
polylogin factors, everywhere I ignored some polylogin factors, we get what we claim. So these are the two things that I want to describe. If I have a very highly sensitive function, the block number actually is... So that's not the parity. Yeah. So somehow parity, very sensitive, but the way I have defined block number today, uh, it is N. Because the minimal changes that you can make are to your neighbors. And that's, do they shut off all other changes? Okay. Uh, maybe it is not fair, actually, parity. There are many, depends on how you define minimal block. Yeah. So, uh, the way I'm doing it right now for parity, it is, uh, it is just N. Okay. But if you had majority function and you looked at all zeros, yeah. now it's a monotone function, so it's probably easy to see, then every set at level N over 2 is a block. It's a minimal block because you have to change n over two bits of zero to make it one, but you could do it in many ways. So the block number perhaps is something like n choose n over two. It is huge. Uh, that's why, because of our definition on the right hand side, I'm not putting an upper bound on this just in terms of the block number. So suppose my block number play exactly the same role as block sensitivity played for Nissan's group, then morally I should have just written block number on the rightmost thing here rather than this block. But then the theorem would be false for parity. Yeah. Because parity does require a huge decision tree. Whereas this number will be like log n. Yeah. And uh, that won't work. So it is possible, we are thinking of it, there might be a different definition of uh, uh, block number, yeah, which might make it nicer, that is without this, okay, that is sandwich between objects like block number, and then it would really be like this answer is at the moment we look at it. So there were two inequalities that I had here, and I'm going to now describe how they are. So, and, uh, so actually, this is probably the, if you're not seeing randomized decision trees or uh, analysis of these, this observation is probably, I mean, this is a standard observation, but it might be something you have to uh, pay attention to. Uh, so maybe I should. So I have used epsilon and one fourth both here, but think of epsilon as one fourth. Okay. Yeah. So suppose you have a randomized decision tree which computes some function with error probability at most epsilon. Okay, let's say epsilon. And you run the randomized decision tree on some input y. Ten has died. So uh, I, I have a different pen. Can I just? Uh, I should be able to link it to this or what? Can I use my this pen to? Yeah, so I was telling you about this set. Uh, so you have this input y, and you picked a tree, a random decision tree from your distribution, and you ask which are the bits that are probed by the tree on this input. Now this is going to be a random set depending on the tree that you pick. So that's why there is 
Now, suppose S is a sensitive block of Y. Okay. So imagine there are two inputs, the input Y and the input obtained by flipping the bits of S. Yes. Now, if your decision tree doesn't read an input where these two differ, and it is making an error on at least one of them. It's finally declaring an answer, which is either zero or one. And if it hasn't seen the difference between y and y plus y with s flipped, then it's making an error. Okay. So you can believe that if the error is small, then the chance that you have gotten away by not reading a bit of s yeah, when presented y as an input will be small. Okay, so later on we will formally justify, but this should seem intuitively reasonable that if there are there is an input y and there is another input which differs in value from y, then the decision tree should be should try to differentiate between these two inputs. And the only way a decision tree can differentiate between two inputs is by reading a position where these two inputs differ. Okay, so the probability that it doesn't read such a bit is at most. Two. So now, so we keep this observation in mind. Uh, later on, if necessary, we can justify it formally. Okay. So this was the first of the inequalities that I said was perhaps new, and that's what uh, we are going to do now. Okay. So uh, consider. Uh, so you had your original decision tree T. Yeah, and we are trying to show it's a randomized decision tree, and we we are trying to show that its um, size is large. Yeah. So what are we going to do? We take the decision tree and run it l times. Okay, I'll tell you what l is. Yeah, l is like two log n. This is like I'm actually doing some uh, amplification or reducing the error, but uh, it turns out that things are one-sided, so I don't want to invoke amplification, but that is the spirit. So you run, you take this decision tree and run it, run it L times. Okay. Then, so fix an input X with high block number. Yeah. So this is where yeah, perhaps the block number of the function is realized. And then, so you Look at the input obtained by flipping one of the blocks of X. So maybe I should draw it here. So this was X. Sorry. This was X. And you flipped one of the blocks of X and you obtained this Y sub B. Okay. And then you can flip another block, another block, another block. And there are various inputs, all minimal in some sense where the function value has changed. Okay. Now, from each of these y sub b's, yeah, if you unflip one of the bits, the function value must change back to this because these are minimal. Yeah? So at these inputs y sub b, the sensitivity is pretty high. Now, the sensitivity is as much as the size of the block. Yeah, because that was a minimal draw. So keep that in mind. So applying the, the theorem uh, or the observation, and I made a mistake again, of course. So this should have been y sub. Yeah. So if you ran your protocol, uh, your uh, randomized decision tree at y sub b, the probability that it misses a sensitive coordinate is at most two epsilon per run of the decision tree, but you have made L runs. And so the probability that you missed it completely in all these L runs is at most, sorry, two epsilon to the end. Is this clear? For every coordinate in this, yeah, you took X, produced this Y, and considered each of these coordinates, and the probability that your this big decision tree, the L fold decision tree, misses this coordinate while it is probing is at most two epsilon to the power n. Okay. 
and sorry, I don't know. So this should have been half. I don't know. I was working with one third at some point. But the point is that uh, the probability that there are only n coordinates in the block. So the probability that this particular run leaves out even one of the sensitive coordinates of y sub b is at most n times. Sorry, what did I do? At most n times, this should have been 2 epsilon. Uh, yeah, this is 2 epsilon to the power n. And we have chosen L something like log n to log n so that this quantity is. So what can be determined? That means in this L fold let repeated tree, yeah. Then it is run on the input uh, y sub b, it ends up reading all the bits of it. Most of the time. Probability at least half. So there must be a run of the tree where at least for half the b's, half the possible blocks, the minimal blocks, the corresponding y sub b's, all the sensitive bits have been read. That means, yeah, so that's what I have. Yes, sir. So there must be a deterministic tree with the property that for at least half of the sensitive, minimal sensitive blocks, the bits that you have read, that you read on y sub b, contains this. Now, is it clear to you that if you run the tree on y sub b, the places that you reach must all be distinct. Okay, maybe I'll just go here. Yeah. So here was uh, your x. Yeah, this one was x. And you changed some bits to produce y sub b1. Then you changed some other bits to get y sub b. Now, there is these are this form an anti chain. So there is a location in one which is not in the other. Okay. So when that read, these two inputs, y sub b1 and y sub b2, could not have followed the same path. Because there is a place where this particular bit was read, and its value in y sub b1 is different from the value in y sub b2. So it could have deviated. Okay, not saying it very well. So from this what we conclude is that this particular deterministic decision tree T star, which is in the support of the L fold repeated uh, decision tree, it has the property that for each of these y sub b's, it reaches a different leaf. That means its size is large, but it is the size of the L fold repeated tree. Yeah. So the number of leaves in the L fold repeated tree is large, so the number of leaves in the original decision tree should be at least 1 over L of this large number. And so you have to pay a log in here okay, because our L was. So the number of leaves is at least half the number of blocks. And this was the L fold decision tree. There's an L in the exponent because if you had a certain number of leaves, under that you put another tree, under that you put another tree, the number of leaves is increasing at the rate of L. So you get this. Okay. Nothing happened. Is it clear? So we used the number of minimal blocks to get this one. Okay, so I'm done with the first inequality. So this block number identified a lot of uh, vectors. These y sub b's, the sensitivity is quite large, and they are distinct. I did not use the fact that the sensitivity is large. There. As in, they in the in the direction of x, like right? the single flip always. The block would have been a very small block. Yeah, I understand that if you have a large number of blocks, then a good number of blocks must be large. 
because there are very few, there are not many small blocks, but we are not explicitly using it the way the argument has been stated. Yeah, the fact that they are an anti-chain already forces the computation to reach different leaves for since the number is large, the number of leaves. But you are right. I mean, it is true that most of the blocks will have a substantial number of bits, which means they are sensitive inputs. But sensitive, if an input is sensitive, that forces the decision tree to query many bits. What we want is that the number of leaves, the number of transcripts you receive is large. Got it. So let me, so I'll move on, but there's no. So our goal now is to show that the deterministic decision tree size is, yeah, is small. Okay. Um, what do we know? Like how do we even bound the size of the deterministic decision tree? Okay. Now in the case of depth, in the case of depth, it was known but it is known that if you have a function with a small BNF yeah, and also small CNF, the, the function can be written as KDNF as well as a KCNF, then you can build a decision tree of size K squared or something. But that is for, that, sorry, there is a size of depth K squared. But we are now in the business of size. Um, in the context of back learning, to have lost my voice, uh, but, but, okay, so okay, uh, we'll, yeah, no, but that's all right. I mean, I can shout here, but will the people online be, still be able to hear? Or? Okay, so should I say something? Yeah. yeah. So, can, are, am I going through your laptop or am I going through some of these devices? Okay, so then you, are there, is there anybody online? I don't know, maybe I touched something. I don't know what I did. Yeah, it's very sensitive. So, meanwhile, I will repeat everything, but let me say to you. So, so yeah, something is being charged here. <laughs> So there is this quantity called N of F. Yeah. So as I was trying to saying earlier, any Boolean function is a coloring of this uh, cube using zeros and ones. Yeah. Some places are zeros, some other places are ones. Okay. And you, it may be that an entire subcube, yeah, all places which have x0, x1 equals 0, the value of the function is the same. Okay, so then it's a subcube of dimension n minus 1. Okay, so there are portions of this subcube, uh, of this cube, which are monochromatic subcubes. Okay, and what is the minimum number of monochromatic subcubes that you need? Yeah, that uh, covers all the inputs. 
Okay. So you can roughly you can think of this as the min terms. So you try to write it as a DNF and you count how many min terms you need in the DNF. Build a CNF, count how many min terms and uh, max terms you need in the CNF, and the total number is called the cover number. Okay. Don't necessarily have to visualize it on the side. So DNF, CNF, DNF size plus CNF size. So that's a good proxy. And it turns out, and this was proved by Aaron Foyt and Hausler, that if you have a function which have, basically they were trying to learn DNFs and CNFs. Okay? So if you have functions that have small DNFs and small CNFs, yeah? uh, so in this case we are counting at the size, the number of terms, okay? then you can build a decision tree with a small number of loops. So if we can show that the randomized decision tree being small, uh, randomized size being small implies cover number is small, then we will be done. Our goal is to show that if randomized size is small, deterministic size is small. We will go via cover number show that the cover number is small, a cover number being small implies decision tree size being small, has already been done by Aaron Foyt. Okay. That's where we are. All right, we do the same thing. This time, you run the algorithm these many times. So, now, if you have a particular... Uh, so here is your input X, yes, and there are many minimal blocks. And suppose there is a decision tree which has read one bit from each of the minimal blocks. So there is a particular path and it has read one bit from each of the minimal blocks. Now it may not, this input may not be X, it may be some other input, but it followed the same trajectory as X, yeah? but on this path, one bit from every minimal block of X has been read. But the claim is, then Y's function value must be the same as X's function value. Because if Y's function value was different from X's function value, then there is a block whose flipping would take you from X to Y. But a bit from that block has already been read. That means Y and X agree there. Okay, it would be a contradiction. Yeah. So is it clear? To say, if you have read one bit from each of the minimal blocks, you actually have a certificate that f of x is something. Okay, good. So that's what we are going to do. We run the algorithm these many times, and then we know that one run of the algorithm with constant probability picks up. See, this was our observation. Yeah. So whenever you have a block at an input and you run the randomized algorithm, it always touches the sensitive block, but only with constant probability. But now we are running it many, many, many times. So it now touches this block with, yeah, it fails to touch with exponentially small probability. And we make this exponentially small probability so small that it covers all possible blocks. Because your block number is small. Yeah, because we are trying to say that if your block number is small, then deterministic complexity is small. So if you have only a few blocks, you can arrange so that your n-fold run has touched every block. But if your n-fold run has touched every block, it has, it has discovered a certificate for x. That means all inputs that reach there you have the same function value as x. So that means that particular leaf where you have reached corresponds to a subject. So the total, every input now, yeah. So now what we do is we take this tree and for at least half the inputs, yeah, half the inputs, they have reached their circuit. Repeat, repeat, n times. So any particular input x fails to have its dis, uh, certificate discovered, have a certificate discovered in the first tree, is probability at, close, at most half. Fails again is half. Again, is half. You did it n times. So the probability that after all these n leaves and trees, in none of the places a certificate was discovered, 
is 2 to the minus n. And there are only 2 to the n inputs. So if you did this and you looked at all the leaves where certificates have been discovered, you would have found a cover for all inputs. Okay. And what is the size of the cover? Yeah, I did not see what was in the slides. So that's what I've said. Yeah. So one L fold repetition discovers a certificate for a given X with high probability. Yeah. Hence, one tree itself discovers the certificate for at least half the inputs. Yeah. And you just repeat n times so that you are done. And then by this. This is the number of leaves in an L fold repetition and you need them n times. So this is the number and you take the logs on this side and you get something like this and ignore in a log n. Yeah, so this is this is how the second part is proved. Uh, I had a proof of the observation. Let me skip it. Yeah, the observation just said that if you have a randomized algorithm, then with high probability it sees a bit in the block, which is sensitive. So we have proved something like this. Uh, so what? So it turns out that my co-authors were actually working on a different conjecture of. Uh, oh, I wish I remembered the names of the authors. Uh, no, um, sorry, it's in the abstract. Uh, yeah, uh, no, uh, Lovett. Uh, yeah. So sorry, maybe it was on the first page. Yeah, I did, forgot to write it here and I didn't memorize. But their point was that imagine decision trees where at any given node, you don't just query a variable, but you can submit a whole set of variables. And, it, and you branch based on the and, no negation. You have to, so you can, suppose you said x1, x2, x1 and x2 were submitted. If x1 and x2 both are 1, you will go right. If even one of them is 0, you will go left. So the function that you are computing at each internal node of this decision tree is a monotone and of positive returns. Okay. And then you can ask this decision tree size. I mean, this is not made up. This has some consequences to um, Communication complexity, which I will not talk about. So, yeah, so lifting decision tree complexity to communication complexity. Yeah. So this was a particular approach. And their question was for such decision trees, is it true that randomization can help? And the result that I described to you, uh, that would actually imply that the deterministic depth of and this decision trees is essentially bounded by the randomized depth. So randomization does not help too much, even if you are allowed to query multiple bits at the same time. Yeah, and we are talking about depth now, yeah, not size. But the size result is leveraged to prove this depth result. Okay. So that's all I have to say. So what did I say? Uh, Nissan showed that the deterministic depth and randomized depth of a Boolean function are all are you know, not separated by too much. Yeah, there is a cubic upper bound. Uh, the relationship between the corresponding measures for sorry, corresponding size measures of decision tree does not seem to have been considered before. Yeah, size word is missing here, yeah, which is what we discussed today. Size, yeah, and our main result was that the deterministic size and randomized size don't differ too much, yeah, apart from these polylogins, and it had a consequence for a conjecture in the paper of Knopf et al. Okay, yeah. Um, so, thank you. That's all. Uh, so at the moment, I think uh, yeah, can probably correct me. Uh, even for depth, we don't know whether uh, the randomized depth and um, we don't have an example 
where there is such a big separation. Too big separation. I think quadratic separation is known, but cubic. So we don't know if things are tight. Uh, we have uh, there, there has to be a power. Okay, it can't be linear. That we know. Yeah, even for uh, size. But uh, we don't know whether the fourth power. Most likely, the fourth power is probably not. I mean, we tried to match it with Nissan's cube, yeah, but we don't know how to do that. I, I would suspect that the present techniques themselves, if carefully implemented, perhaps can push the, that four down to three. But uh, after that, I don't know. Question? Uh, that would be a nice question. Yeah. So, uh, suppose you have a Yeah, so basically, uh, since we are talking decision trees, so you are saying if the alphabet is not 0, 1, but the alphabet is some, uh, yeah, yeah, something else. So, I mean, the natural thing is you could also think of those numbers as encoded in binary, and if the alphabet is finite size, each particular node of your new tree perhaps can grow into something. Now, each time you do that, you take a factor. In the depth, it is just decent, it is log, but uh, in, uh, in the size, you might get a power. Yeah. Because uh, each branching of two is now being implemented as a branching. So there will be many, many leaves which give the same value. Yeah, and, uh, so that I don't have a better answer. Yeah. I have another question. So, the assumption that it's done is less than one. That's one. Less than one. So, does it affect all the. No, no. So, the, yeah, so if I had really done it very honestly, I should have first said that with repeating pro uh, these protocols and computing a majority. So, imagine this L fold repetition, because things were one sided, I just, and we were interested only in hitting things. So, I just ran it L times and ran away with it. But uh, you could also say that you would run the algorithm L times, collect the answers that each of the decision tree gave, and take the majority. Okay, And that would blow the error down exponentially in the number of repetitions. And uh, so if, it is, if you are interested in decision trees which, have, which are correct with probability 0.99, then you could start with the decision tree with uh, error probability one third, repeat it a constant number of times, 20 times. And then you take a majority of the answers that the various decision trees. Uh, you people on the uh, online are allowed to uh, read. Okay, okay. So if you're online and uh, listening to me, please and have a question. Yeah. It's unmute. It, it, does it give like a connection between that cover number and the. So I'm wondering if this yes, has so any implication on learning. So, so, no, no. So, it does say. So, the result of Aaron Point and Hausler was that uh, things that have small decision tree size, yeah, the uh, deterministic decision tree size, they are learnable. learnable. To our result now, we say that even if something has small randomized decision tree size, it is learnable, but it's cheating. We say that that is because you also have small dis deterministic decision tree and hence it. That's an implication. But there is this slightly unsatisfactory thing that there is a, our bound is not in terms of block number. Some parameter of the function yeah, should appear on both ends rather than these complexity measures being there on the right hand side. Uh, we have some ideas, but. Bring okay. yeah. everybody out and the batteries and the <laughs> Thank you.